chapter 17. The rain has stopped long before we're out of the city and back at Pete's house. Pete tells me to think about what sort of style I might like to try for the recital. I thank him for taking me to Kirkwood and he says a million times not to thank him. The best way to show my appreciation is to practice. He even refuses his weekly $15, arguing that he didn't really teach me anything today. I, dis I disagree. Pete offers to drop me off, but I decide to walk home from his house. I'm supposed to be coming home from Kristen's. It will look pretty weird if my parents caught sight of Pete's car while I'm walking in the door. I'm just arriving home when I hear the phone ringing. I dash through the front hall to pick up. Hello? Sam? It's Christian. Then another voice on the line says, Sam can't come to the phone right now. She's too busy picking her nose. My brother, the little brat, must have grabbed the phone at the same time I did. I can, I can have her call you back when she's dug up all the... Get off the phone, I yell. There's a high-pitched scream, then a click, then, I, then a silence. Um, Sam, Kristen says. Yeah, I'm right here, I say, and I haven't been picking my nose or anything. As long as you're wiping them on his pillow, we both laugh. Everything's okay? Fine. You could have gotten us busted calling here. You were supposed to call me when you got back. It's like 8, 8.30. I was starting to get worried. I check the clock on the wall. She's right. Sorry, I just got in. Everything's fine. Did my parents call to check up on me? Nope, all clear. Her voice goes quiet as she says, I haven't heard from you about my pool party. That's right. I almost forgotten. Dr. Pullman never contacted my parents, so I'm not officially grounded. I should be clear to go. When is it again? It's on Saturday, about three weeks from now. I'll be there, I say at first. Then my mouth drops open and the hairs on my neck stand up. Wait, I can't. Silence at first. Then she says, why not? I have a... Careful with the way you say it, Sam. I have a drum thing going on. A drum thing? Yeah, it's like a recital, only way cooler, I mean. Not as cool as your party, but it's no big deal, whatever. I hear her breath quickening through the phone. She says it's okay, but I can tell when she's mad, and she's mad right now. She wouldn't, she wouldn't be if I had that headphone jack to make her understand it's nothing personal. It is a big deal, Christian. I totally want to come. It's just that this drum thing is a music academy. I want to meet the person in charge tonight. That's why I needed you to cover for me. It's really important. More important than my party? I get it. Wait, Kristen, listen. It's okay, Sam. I just, I'll just talk to you later. Then the line clicks, and the phone is silent. Christian is gone. I let the phone drop to the, crown, to the ground with a clang, not bothering to hang it up. My brother appears in a Norse doorway and says, back to picking your nose? I can't even bear to look at him, so I cradle my head and my forearms to cover my eyes. Why did Christian call? Weren't you just at her house? All you guys do is talk all day long. When I still don't say anything, his voice becomes quieter. Sam, are you okay? I'm fine, I say through my arms. The phone starts bleeding, it's familiar off the hook warning. Do you want me to hang that up for you? No, I'll do it. I was just kidding about the nose picking thing and I don't really care how long you talk on the phone. I press my eyes harder into my arms and say, I know, I just want to be left alone. Brian stares at me for a few more moments before I hear him walk away. I grab the phone from where it landed on the floor and hang it up. Then I think about Christian and everybody else who will be at her party. And I sink to the floor wondering why the things that make me happy make everyone else so mad. I'm going to do a rock solo. Those are the words repeating in my head when I wake up the next morning. Not that Christian is angry or my little brother is annoying. I have transformed them both into something else. I'm going to play full on rock and I do not care what the classical musicians think about it. I practice it in my head when, while I sleep and on my notebook underneath my desk during class. Danny is acting differently this week. He hears me tapping loud and clear but doesn't say any of his usual insults. Not a single annoying or idiot. I almost miss it at this point, but not that much. Saturday arrives with a brand new level of heat. Summer is kicking in, but oddly enough, I don't mind as much as I thought. I'm a tougher girl than I, than I was when all of this started. I mow Wanda's lawn first, as usual. Only this time, she congratulates me on getting into the recital. 
You and Pete talk a lot, don't you? I ask. Every week, she says, sometimes more if I see him out in his yard. Every week, I think. A crazy thought occurs to me. I ask, are you one of his students? She must see the shock looked on my face because she narrows her eyes and says, is that so odd? Just because I've met Shakespeare in person doesn't mean I can't play the drums. My arthritis may keep me from hitting as hard as, or as, hard as you rock types, but I still get the job done. I smile at the thought, Wanda, the 83-year-old drummer. I can totally imagine what her lessons must be like. Something about a crabby old lady playing drums is just what I need to stay positive today. I'm surprised to find Pete excited, excited at our Monday lesson when I tell him my plan to perform a rock solo. I expected him to push me towards jazz, but he's all about rocking the Kirkwood Music Academy. Just make it something memor memorable, he says. I fully intended to. We spent the entire lesson designing it, pacing it, starting it off with something that builds, expanding it into new sounds, and giving it a climax that makes the whole thing soar. It's harder to do this than it sounds, but we managed to put it together a piece at a time. I'm playing through, through it for what feels like the twin of time when I smack the floor of Tom hard enough to shake the room. One of the legs on the drum stakes buckles and the whole thing topples onto the cement basement floor. I grit my teeth and sit up straight, holding my breath. I glance at Pete, afraid to see his cherry tomato face scowling back at me, ready to kill me for breaking his drum that was kind of broken already. When I insist, what I see instead is a look of disbelief as he says, you might want to take it down a notch. Sorry, I whisper. Then I pick the drum off the floor and fiddle with the leg stand until it's back in place and able to support the drum, kind of. Then Pete says something that scares me. You know there's no way you'll, you'll perfect this in time, right? I wait for the goosebumps to go away. Thanks for believing in me, I say sarcastically. I do believe in you. I just want you to plan accordingly. You're not going to be perfect for this, and you'll drive yourself crazy trying. He leans in closer. You just need to make it sound like you care. I do care. Of course you do. Try playing through it again, and this time, try not to destroy my floor tom. I play through it again and mess up seven times before stopping altogether. Pete's right. I can't make this perfect, but I can't make it look like I care. At the end of the lesson, Pete gives me a stern look, the same kind as my teacher at school. He says, what about your parents? Have you talked to them? I stare at the floor, not yet. You're putting me in a difficult place. I don't like difficult places. I scoop my drum throne so that I'm facing away from him. I promise I'll do it this week. My teeth clench and my brain throbs trying to think of a way to explain everything to my parents. I want to, be, I want to believe Pete understands and trusts that he's right about telling them because the thought of confessing sits heavy in my stomach.